It's February 6th, 2023. Welcome to episode 236 of Rook. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Salam, Dustan Aziz. Durud Bashama. Hello to you from Toronto, Canada. Try this with me. This revolution is evolving, it is maturing. It's a revolution that is an evolution. So this is just a short note to anyone out there propagating the notion that the uprising in Iran is effectively dead. The idea, I suppose, is that you're not seeing daily massive action on the streets. So the revolution was a misnomer and it's basically already over, business as usual. Well, how about we entertain a different perspective? The revolution in Iran is not dying at all. It is evolving, it's morphing, growing, expanding, and maturing into a different phase that looks less like a million people toppling a statue in the streets of Tehran, but finds its efficacy in destroying this regime through a death of a thousand cuts. What does maturing look like? Well, it's less wide-eyed zeal and fantasies of a democratic Iran where everyone is playing battle on their Stratocaster by next week. But it's a long and hard-fought recognition on behalf of our global community that this thing needs to happen at a pace. How about some examples? Here are four of many reasons to believe the revolution is evolving. Number one, continuing defiance inside the country. You see, the action inside Iran is less overt and en masse now, but consistent, persistent, and disruptive, and increasingly widespread. Think of the turban tipping and graffiti that the regime has to whitewash off walls across the country daily like they're closing off comment sections for fear it's all bad. Think of the women across Iran who refuse to wear the hijab in their daily lives. Think of the social media activism, the nightly chance of death to the dictator, and the continued mass protests in places like Kurdistan and Baluchistan. Think of a new survey that just came out showing that over 80% inside Iran do not want an Islamic Republic. Think of those things, and the revolution doesn't look that dead. Number two, authorities in Iran are squirming. Did you see the old reformist names from the regime's ill-fated reform days speaking out this weekend? That change is going to be necessary? Sounds like some folks are preparing the lifeboats to jump ship. And then, of course, there was the Supreme Leader suddenly announcing a potential pardoning of political prisoners. So what, are you going to execute them or pardon them? The confusion speaks to the scrambling of a regime on the run. The regime's fear of the people of Iran is evolving. Number three, international awareness is growing. Look, despite ongoing attempts to resuscitate the nuclear deal and keep the Islamic Republic afloat, the West is having to cave to the reality that Iranians won't stay put while the West continues to enable the mullahs. And whether it's celebrities trumpeting the names of prisoners, MPs declaring political guardianships, or the Grammys giving Dear Shervin an award, the humanitarian crisis of Iran has finally gotten global attention, and it's increasing. And part of the maturing process of the revolution is making sure the world knows they have to stop helping this murderous regime. And finally, number four. The power of a unified opposition encompassing the Iranian diaspora, which can be historic and omnipotent. While the revolution is not very easy to openly pursue inside Iran in the face of brutal crackdowns, internet blackouts, arrests and executions by a desperate gaggle of ayatollahs, the global Iranian community has picked up the slack. And for all its diversions and divisions, the diaspora understands the need for unity at this time. And the power of a united, strong, and determined Iranian diaspora with leadership, resources, and passion is unstoppable. Never in the last 44 years have Iranians come together to coordinate an action to get rid of this miserable regime. And judging by the hundreds of thousands that will take to the streets this weekend from Paris to Los Angeles to Toronto, the community is actively heeding that slogan, the time is now. No, the revolution is not dead. It's evolving, it's maturing, and it's headed exactly in the direction it should. And death of a thousand cuts will be the message that we send. And this regime, before too, too long, is going to meet its end.
Coming up, our feature guests are the actor and producer Mojan Aria, fresh from the Sundance Film Festival, where his latest film won the Audience Award, and political scientist and journalist Gilda Sahebi in Berlin. Plus, the Rook Roundtable. This is Rook, episode 236, The Revolution is Evolving. Here we are in the Rook studio. I'm joined by Pega. Hello. Hello. Shai is here as well. Hi, is that? Hey, listen, you know, I did the essay about the, the revolution evolving there, but um, I have to say first and foremost to the people in Turkey, um, oh, yeah. where, where we have a not insignificant audience mm-hmm. for this show, our thoughts go out to you. Wow, do our, our thoughts ever go out to you. Yeah. What a horrendous specter of that 7.8 earthquake leaving thousands uh, Potentially, you know, killed Rever- reverberations in uh, in Syria and in, in Lebanon and in the, the yeah, region, yeah. even in Iran. Yeah, right? yeah, right. yeah. Um, and uh, oh, it's just yeah. horrible. Yeah, it's just you wake up one day and and your your world is mm-hmm. is destroyed. Yeah, I was looking at some of the images and just heartbreaking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it was last week that I think last it was last week I said like it's hard to like um, a news come out and capture the attention and like uh, because we all think nonstop about uh, Iran. It was Iran, yeah. But this earthquake, it makes me like Hamashi. I'm thinking about. Well, it was them. strange. It was a strange thing. I mean, obviously, we we got to kick off by saying congratulations to Shervin mm-hmm. and the, uh, the 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 Grammy win. Um, and there's been so much um, celebration. I'm sure it's going to come up a few times during this show, you know. But uh, but the idea that you know w- w- we all love this guy and this great song that he that he sang that's become this anthem. But it also feels like Iran Iranians won, you know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like a Grammy Award. But that it was so weird because as that was happening mm-hmm. the news about the turkey earthquake was coming out and, yeah. mm-hmm. and so it's like the man contrast of the two we can't sure. even celebrate the you know because i yeah i mean I, I i felt sick to my stomach seeing uh, turkey's yeah. such a beautiful country amazing people and and um i just can't even yeah. imagine i just can't even i was telling you earlier shia that when i was a little kid i was so afraid of earthquakes really yeah it was a thing that i just thought you know, well, and, growing and up in Canada, growing up in Canada, and I and I looked up like there's, the, you know, Toronto is not in the same kind of zone as yeah. much of Iran or the or the California, California coast, exactly. but it's still we're still in an earthquake zone to a certain extent here. Really? Yeah, yeah. Some low oh, here percentage. Here I was oblivious to no, that. No, no, no. We are, and so I would, you know, I rem- I, rem- I remember it, saying to my dad, like, he was like, go to bed, and I was like, I can't, and he was like, why? Well, well, go to bed. You know, I was like, well, what about if there's an earthquake? You know, I was, <laughs> I was really, really, yeah, I was freaked out by it because it's just, I mean, it's it's just one of the worst things. Did that, you see a movie or something? Yeah, that there was that a movie. Out? Okay, I was gonna. There say was a movie actually in the in the. I don't know if I saw it when it first came out, but it it was in the early '80s or something. Right. It was like a with Lauren Green, I think, the Canadian actor, uh, called Earthquake. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the aptly sense. called earthquake. Yeah. 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 So yeah, that that probably that didn't help. It. Yeah. Um, when you go to school here, do, do they teach you how how to defend yourself against the earthquake? Or no. 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 Oh. Mind you, I don't know what they teach now. They probably teach you know avoiding I mean, gunshots now. Well, I mean, they did. We actually, didn't do that when I was yeah, a kid. You know. They did when I was in school. Really? Yeah. That uh, three years of difference between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> Three. <laughs> no, in Iran, in school, sometimes uh, they randomly ring a bell to practice to if there's an yes, earthquake. Yes. Anyway, look, I mean, it's oh, the the videos. I uh, our thoughts are with you. I know that doesn't really help, but and and if there's some organizations that are out there that you trust, uh, here's here's a time to support people mm-hmm. and and um, and keep the focus on uh, Turkey and the region there because it is just horrendous. With that said. Congratulations, Shervin, Shervin, on the Grammy yes. Grammy win. I don't know that uh, Shervin winning a Grammy is going to change everything, you know, in terms of the revolution. But um, it 
you know, to put this into context, Mojan Aria is coming up. Uh, he's a, an actor and a producer. He just um, starred in a film that has just debuted at the Sundance Film Festival, which is a pretty prestigious indie film festival, an independent film festival in Utah. And this film called Shada mm-hmm. uh, got the audience award for, you know, favorite global film or right. something like that. Uh, and I know Mojan grew up in in Australia Mm -hmm. and I've seen interview in fact he was born in Sydney grew up in Australia and in LA not not somebody who's grown up in Iran and I've seen him talk about his relationship with Iran very much the way I feel you know Mm -hmm. this this kind of where do I fit in and you know growing up wondering about the image of you know stereotypes of being Iranian Mm -hmm. and all of that Um, and these things like a really cool guy who's written an, an amazing song that has inspired a, uh, an international audience. We, you know, growing up, I just didn't. We didn't have that. I didn't have that at my fingertips. You know, right. um, not to take anything away from the great Iranian stars of the day, but I mean, this Sherevin winning a Grammy is indicative of a moment where there's. Uh, Iranians coming to the fore and this rebirth of pride and mm-hmm. um, you could just feel it. You could just feel people. I mean, when was the last time Iranians around the world watched the Grammys? Well, that's you what know? I was going to say. Never, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I was actually thinking about that last night because um, on social media with talking with friends and, you know, our friend text messages groups and everything, everyone, that's all they were talking about. Yeah. Every Iranian I knew last night was glued to their TV waiting for that moment. It was so awesome, too, because growing up, I was really into Mm hip-hop, and the Iranians were never into hip-hop. You know, I know that that's changed now. There's, you know, uh, there was a wave of hip-hop or Hitchcast and then Airphone Mm -hmm. and something like Tumaj now, which we will talk about in a moment. But but, um, it was really fun thinking about Iranians around the world having to sit through the Dr. Dre and uh, (laughs) hip-hop tribute, you know, and kind of like wondering, what is this music? You know, what are they doing? And... Uh, yeah, it was, it was, <laughs> that was actually the highlight of the show to a certain extent. I did kind of think, uh, how, how did we feel about Jill Biden coming out? And, I was going to bring that up, right. actually. I think that uh, there's, I mean, I think a lot of people would say, you know, great, thanks for coming out and, and uh, you know, saying that Chairman won, but talk to your husband about what he should be doing, you know. There's a lot of that there's floating that. around. Yeah. But then there's also the, also we, the contrast. We, we, yeah, Dr. Biden, we love you, you know, Jill Biden, but you could have learned to say bad oh yeah. I was going to get to that, yeah. Would it, have, <laughs> would it have killed you to, you know, sp- <laughs> practice for three minutes? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's not a big deal, but, uh, you know, kind of. Would have been nice. Would have been for nice. Sure. Would have been nice. But I, you know, I just felt like, uh, I'm not even sure why there. I guess, I guess this was the best way to do it. Like, why weren't there nominees? And and it, it felt like a. I didn't want it to feel like some special thing that's happening outside of the Grammys. I wanted it to well, feel I like there's pop album of the year, and then there's this one that you know. Yeah. Me, you know. But to be fair, it is. Um, I think it's through a different committee, the Blue Ribbon right, Foundation something like or something like and that. And it's brand new. And, and it's brand new. This was yeah. the first one, so you know I can give them that but I wish they had spent just a little bit more time on it like I, I almost felt like it was just so quick and exactly. it was just you exactly know. it was like uh, yeah but but and this is a big one uh, having worked on these kind of shows before mm-hmm. and stuff like that you know there's a hundred awards or yeah. more that don't get it on television that don't make it to the TV right. broadcast so yes. the fact that it was on, on the, the TV, TV broadcast, broadcast in the final hour yeah. you know that was actually quite deferential I have to say these some of these Iranians on social media you know around 8 p.m. 9 p.m. I was seeing people go he won. congratulations yeah. he won and I'm like I, I don't think it's been thing. announced yet yeah. you know and so they were just kind of get a, trying to get ahead of it and, exactly. and and people didn't know if they were supposed to share that or not no. and I was all ready to say congratulations which I did with the post as soon as but I was like shouldn't we wait till it's I announced yeah. you know what if it doesn't happen yeah. And, yeah. I was checking my Twitter feed throughout the whole thing it was a few conspicuous else, people you know? that were yeah. that were kind of getting ahead of themselves mm-hmm. yeah you can't <laughs> Two other Iranian also won Grammy. Yeah. Last That's right. Night. One is Hamid Saidi, but the other one is Sahba Mutalebi, which she's a girl. And, you know, 
winning a Grammy as an Iranian female in this revolution mm-hmm. is Amazing. pretty iconic. Amazing. And I, I wish Iranian actually would notice that win. And thank you for mentioning that. And by the way, shout out to our friend Hamid mm-hmm. Saidi yeah, for yeah. also winning his second Grammy. Yeah. Second Grammy, I guess yeah. it's getting boring for him. He's yeah. just winning <laughs> Grammys every year. What's the big deal? Uh, so Mojan Arya, I'm so excited and grateful to have him coming on. You know, this guy's... He's doing great things as an actor. Mm-hmm. He's uh, appearing alongside Jason Momoa and and uh, and and uh, who else? Uh, what's the great Australian actor? Uh, Heath handsome Le- Heath Ledger. No, no. Well, no. no Heath Ledger. He won yeah. an award for the Heath Ledger Award. No, 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 no. You don't have to do that. Don't look it up. I'm gonna. You're gonna. I'm gonna tell you. He's he played Wolverine. Um. Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. Okay. He's appeared with Hugh Jackman. Yes. Uh, and, a, and a number of... Anyway, um, Mojan is... First of all, he's... So he's played mostly American roles. Mm-hmm. He's been in a lot of films. And then he's... this. I think this is his first Iranian film he's in. The one that wow. just got... Uh, um, that just appeared at, at Sundance. And Mojan has become very active mm-hmm. uh, in the revolution as well. And, and he's a really smart guy. I'm looking forward to having him here for a chat. Then we go to Berlin for Gilda Sahibi, who we've had on before. And she's she's really brilliant. You know, she's got, uh, the, you know, the classic Iranian underachiever. Mm-hmm. She's a doctor <laughs> and a political scientist and a journalist. Uh, and uh, and uh, she, because of where she is, in Europe, it's. I think it's instructive mm-hmm. and helpful for us to get the um, the perspective of what's happening in Europe because I feel like we some so many so much of the time we're coming from a North, North American, American diaspora yeah. perspective. Let alone inside Iran, the diaspora is different from mm-hmm. continent to continent, for from sure. country to country, from region to region. But but certainly to hear. Get her perspective on, you know, the EU declining to put the IRGC on the terrorist list. Mm-hmm. Uh, get her perspective on whether she believes the revolution is continuing to evolve, as, as uh, I was just saying. So, that is coming up now. I have an announcement to make, which is a long time coming because we've been working on this for a while. Um, we depend on and and really appreciate and rely on you folks out there to uh, keep Rook alive Mm -hmm. and our Rook Media um, team and and content and we do that through crowdfunding and it's been (laughs) it's been a couple years now we've been trying to figure this thing out and we finally have launched our Patreon page so if you go to our website and we hope you do especially if you're just happening upon us today, and you know, and you want to check things out, I, I completely respect that. And but if you're a regular, you know, if you're a regular listener, we don't do this for profit, but we do need to stay alive. If you're a regular uh, who's checked out a lot of episodes of Rook, or you you come to this program and you enjoy it, and you have the means, mm-hmm. uh, we appreciate your support. So, what do you do? You go to the website. You go to the website. Click Rookmedia.com. 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 Right. You click on support us. Okay. It takes you to a page that gives you all of the Have we made the, the support us button easy to find? We have. It's, right. it's quite Remarkable big. that we figured yeah. that out finally. <laughs> all right. You can click on support us. It'll yeah. take you to the support us page. Okay. And there you will find the information for our Patreon page. All right. And also a direct link now, to the, the Patreon Now, the people who don't page. know, Patreon sounds like Patreon, but <laughs> Patreon is a... Is a is a platform right. that a lot of people who are in you know into podcasts and stuff will recognize. With that, most people or many people who use who do podcasts and want a funding model, a crowdsourcing model, you use Patreon, mm-hmm. and um, it's dependable, it's reliable, it's safe, and so you sign up there mm-hmm. for a certain amount of uh, per month. That's right, and. and then- uh, you actually have access to exclusive content. That's right. Via that page. That's right. Do you, do you have some of that? Do you, do you, can yeah, you explain we, that? Yeah, for sure. So All some right. of the exclusive content is going to include bonus content from the shows. Um, we're going to do some um, fun and engaging things with our members. So things like Q&A sessions, um, live chats after the show. Um, I think you and Shia are going to do the song of the week. Yeah, I bet sure Shia be has been told about that, but <laughs> we talked about it a year ago. So I'm sure... <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, the song of the week. I yeah. really wanted to do this. This is for Rook members. So you become a, you go on the Patreon, and each week we pick a song and share with you and tell you why it's the song that you should be listening to. That's right. This week, sometimes Persian. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Sometimes. Interesting. Kharaji. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> 
there's a there's a it's a there's an American album. You know, Shia and I have talked for years about doing a, a podcast where we would just like uh, I would tell him which album he should listen to. He would tell me, which is kind of what we've been doing over the years. Mm-hmm. Anyways, he's introduced me to so much great uh, Persian music right. that uh, goes beyond Mortaza <laughs> and uh, the Black Cats. Not that there's anything wrong with it, right. but. Uh, but uh, but yeah, there's an album uh-huh. and some songs that I'm still I've never introduced to you. Okay. That I will do it as we as we share Song with the rock week. members. I think I have yeah. to be a patron. Then. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> member uh, on Patreon. And actually, we already yeah. have a video up there. Oh. Um, that's only oh. exclusive to our members. So oh. if they check it out, they'll see the video. And I've got a couple of photos I'm going to be putting up shortly All as right. well. So become a supporter of Rook, a Rook member um, through our Patreon page at rookmedia.com. Sorry to take your time with this, but uh, uh, we spent a lot of time putting this together, so we wanted to make an announcement about it today, and we hope that um, you'll come and support us. Okay, we've got Mojang coming up, we've got Gilda coming up, but first let's get to a Rook roundtable here and just talk about what's happened in the last few days. We talked about Shervian, of mm-hmm. course. Uh, I, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention at least one other musician, and that is the rapper Tumaj Salehi, yes. who, uh, to, is it today that marks 100 days? I believe it's today, actually, that it's 100 days. Not only has he been in prison, he's been in solitary confinement for 100 days, which is, I mean, I can't even get my head around yeah. you know, one day in Ghastly. solitary confinement, yeah. let alone a hundred days. And I mean, we've just seen so little information coming out from Iran in regards to his situation. And I think the important thing is just to keep him top of mind more than anything else. And just the situation that he's been in and the solitary confinement. The campaigns for some of the better known people who've been detained in Iran, whether it's Taran Ali Dusti mm-hmm. or uh, Jafar Pano, he seemed to have had some effect. You know, there's been this ongoing campaign. So many people have done such, there was a group here in Toronto that was, you know, some advocating for too yeah. much. There were, there's, I know, Airfon and a bunch of others have done so much work mm-hmm. around this. But um, we don't even know, we don't even hear anything from him, right? No, I think the last um, thing I read was from back in October. And I mean, maybe it's just something I haven't seen. But and to recap, Tumaj is a rapper mm-hmm. who was imprisoned w- um, for he was quite overtly speaking out against the against regime. Against the regime, yes. Yeah. And I mean, fearlessly so. Yeah, and again, he was one of many people who have been quote unquote charged with this. Um, what was it in Farsi? Moharebe. Moharebe. the fail Yeah. 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 I, I I won't ever learn that. <laughs> right. Well, so. Our thoughts are with too much. Yes. All right. What else do we have the last few days? Um, actually, going back to Sherevin for a second, I did want to add one more thing. Um, I saw a video um, come out of, I mean, it's more of an audio, really, actually. But a group of individuals in a prison mm-hmm. somewhere in Iran were singing Baroye. And to hear that, I thought was just, and I, it, it came immediately after his win. So mm-hmm. I would imagine that somehow they heard about the win and, and they decided to start singing it. And it was just, I mean, I had goosebumps listening to you it. You know, this, it's so interesting because, you know, I, I when I posted about uh, Barria yesterday, I said imme- it, didn't, it has now become immediately iconic. Mm-hmm. It's not like it wasn't a legendary song yeah. that didn't exist three three months ago or four months uh, already. But if if every Iranian around the world didn't already know this song mm-hmm. after this Grammy win, yeah. and I can't think of, I'm hard pressed to think of a song that you know has that kind of crossover in this era, mm-hmm. in a different era where um, there wasn't as much music coming out, there wasn't as much access to to music. Mm-hmm. You know, there 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 might have been a, a you know many Iranians would know a Gugush song or or. English speaking people would know a Beatles song mm-hmm. or something like that but in this era for for something so universally mm-hmm. I mean is there an Iranian that doesn't know that song it'd be you'd be hard pressed to find not. one right yeah. it is just remarkable yes it's something it's historic okay. it's historic uh, and and inspiring we should mention there was a it was a recording. Shiva Nagar, who was on our show last Thursday, mm-hmm. talked about this. Uh-huh. She was going to be there, and I saw that she was there. She posted about it. There was a recording of Bad Oye yes. done in L.A. Yes. on the weekend yeah. with thousands of people yeah. singing this. I can't wait to see what the results of this are going to be. Yeah. It was. Um, I saw that, actually. It, it was at the Hanson studio, um, and um, they had asked for anyone 
who wanted to join to join and they did this kind of RSVP method where I think the last count they were at was like 16,000 or something like that and that was in the early days when I looked mm. at it so wow. that'll be incredible to see weird thing about battle yeah I do get because so many people have covered it now mm -hmm. and and some of them fantastically but I get a little tired with the covers I get you know when somebody's say oh another person has done battle yeah it does, you know I don't it does, I don't get super excited about it yeah. because I feel like okay we've heard this a lot yes. but I never get tired of the uh -huh. Shervin yeah. version I, I never agree. get tired of it I will hear it randomly and I love hearing it it's weird it's a real that's a magical song it really with is. him his yeah. voice his his performance that imperfect you know one-off or whatever he did it's yeah and um, also his Instagram post immediately after the win. And did you mm, see that? Yeah. yeah the, the caption. I mean, that just it. it Explain. Well, the caption. Remember, there's people listening yes, that don't know yes. everything that's in well, your Well, I, I just imagine yeah. that you know this has been shared so many times. But so uh, immediately after the win, um, he posted on Instagram, um, and the caption was simply "We won." Yeah. And the fact that he wrote "We won" and gave this feeling not i won yeah, yeah exactly i mean i can only imagine every other iranian feeling the same way that i did and it was just this sense of pride and overwhelming emotion and just it was wonderful to see yeah that. i think he meant shervin me and shia when he was <laughs> saying we the three of us yeah. but uh and i and i saw a, a tweet that it was also interesting that it says we share win no. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> so I mean, uh, I I hate to go from the the good news. By the way, I'm going to talk about these with our guests too because these things that are happening are uh, it's hard to have conversations with somebody who's Iranian without the without asking mm -hmm. about. It. I mean, Mojan's in LA. I want to know what he thinks of this yeah. uh, this Shervin. But uh, we w there's there's some less auspicious news from the week. How about this? Let me mention this because I mentioned it in my um, opening dialogue there. Uh, there's a poll that came out on the weekend. Yes. I think it's called GOMON. GOMON, Gom I think, which is an acronym for a group for analyzing and measuring attitudes in Iran. They're from the Netherlands. They are, And yes. apparently pretty credible. I'll ask mm -hmm. Gilda about this. But it's a fascinating poll. I, I, I was staring at it for three hours yeah. on Saturday because the results are, um, are they're quite outstanding. Mm -hmm. I mean, first of all, it's people, it's Iranians inside and outside of Iran. That's right. And the headline is 81% of those polled in this survey say they do not want an Islamic Republic. And the only 15% inside Iran say they want an Islamic Republic. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even if this survey is inaccurate, um, how much can it be an accurate buy? I mean, that yeah. is a that that those are really those are numbers that we assumed or we hoped or we thought, but but those are really t and it kind of makes sense to me that there'd be at least fifteen percent that would still support the mm -hmm. Islamic uh, regime. You know, I mean, some of them, a lot of them, work somehow or affected economically by um, the regime. Uh, but that was really interesting. Then there was the breakdown, of course, of the the popularity of the opposition leaders. Yeah, I mean, there were so many questions that. Um, were just mind-blowing in terms of the results. Um, but before I, I point out a couple of them, I want to add that there was over 200,000 respondents who participated in this survey. Um, and it was through a very brief period of time. So the fact that so many individuals, both inside and outside of Iran, were so eager to get this information across was is also something mm -hmm. to note. So I think the survey took place between December 21st to 31st of last year. Um, 200,000 respondents, 157,000 of those respondents were inside Iran. And of those living outside of Iran, they were spread across 130 different countries. So this is this is a large pool to have, you know, this kind of statistic come yeah. from. And really, I think, covers pretty much the majority of Iranians yep. across the globe. Yep. Um, going back to um, the, the question of yes or no towards the Islamic Republic, um, of those who responded abroad, 99% 99 uh, 99 of individuals responded no. Yeah, the diaspora that, is that not I having mean, anything. With it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was a yeah. really a big number to look at. Um, in regards to nationwide protests, 80% of those inside the country support the protests. 14% um, um, think that 
uh, sorry, 67% believe that the protests will succeed. Um, there was questions about um, support of the varying individuals, mm-hmm. and that was that I thought was something that was of interest as well. Well, the, there's a there's a I mean, there's only one headline really, which is that um, Reza Pahlavi was way ahead of everybody, mm-hmm. right? And that was both inside and outside the country. Yeah, yeah. It's I mean, again, look. Caveat disclaimer: We don't the, these polls are impossible to know how specific they can get. I, I would imagine it's, it's quite precarious trying to poll inside Iran. But I've heard this is a credible firm. I heard this they've done these kind of surveys a lot. Mm-hmm. So again, if you, even if we bake in that that's, that there's some inaccuracies, um, remarkable to 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 find out. I mean, I don't think I was that surprised in the diaspora the support for Reza Pahlavi, but inside Iran, mm-hmm. I thought that was that was news, you know. Yeah, what for if, what it's worth. Yeah, one of the other things that was um, interesting to me as part of the survey was when uh, individuals were asked about punitive measures for the officials responsible, um, so the regime in essence. Um, I thought it was. I mean, I knew it would be dark, but. Very dark in terms of answers. Um, so 16% would agree that revolutionary executions of officials should take place. 29% agree with the death penalty um, via court verdict. Yeah, wow. uh, 24% would seek punishment other than the death penalty. And then it just... People are angry. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Before I say too much, I, 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 I talked about Reza Pahlavi. There are other names on the list that yes. were also there. Uh, Ali Dai, Ali Karimi, Hamid Ismailiyoun. Hossein uh, Ronaghi. Hossein Ronaghi. Yep. Uh, and then uh, Nazanin Boyadi and Masih Ali Nijad were yep. there as well. Um, but yes, he the, the, the Reza Pahlavi. Did that surprise you, Shai, that uh, Reza Pahlavi is that popular inside Iran? Um, no. Really? No. Uh, um, <laughs> no. No. Okay. All right. <laughs> I think I it thought, also. I thought. I thought you. I thought because you usually say maybe there's more people in Iran supporting the regime than we know, and you know. Oh, I mean, yes. you say that. Yeah, but I mean, I, I wouldn't surprise that they are supporting. Re- I mean, the people who is in this survey, uh, I wouldn't. That's surprise. what I was gonna say. I that's think true. amongst yeah. the group that was represented and amongst the names that were kind mm. of given there, I think there were 34 individuals um, who were listed as part of the survey. Mm. And I think amongst those individuals, for varying reasons, mm. it makes sense that that he would be the forefront of. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Poll. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, what else? I, I I know what's something I want to talk about. Well, you know. mentioned it in in your um in your essay, the, pardon? the pardoning. Yeah. I thought that was something that um, oh we should definitely yeah. chat about. Very timely. Um, theatrical move. This is Ayatollah. The, this is the Supreme Leader Khamenei has. I, do you have the exact language of this? He has basically, from what I understand, um, offered or mm-hmm. suggested that he may, they may pardon some of the political. But first of all, I don't like the language of pardoning because the pardoning implicitly suggests they've done something wrong. Well, that's the thing. These people I, haven't done anything that, wrong. And that's know? exactly what I want to get to. So speaking of the language, first of all, um, the Supreme Leader has the authority to issue pardons only at the recommendation of the judiciary, however, mm. within the Iranian constitution and some article of it. So that's the first thing. It's not just, you know, But isn't he the Supreme Leader? He is. Can't but he just dictate to what, uh, isn't that the whole idea? Yes, but there's also others involved. Okay. So it's not just right. that simple. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, you have to be a qualified, quote unquote, inmate. So what that means, yeah. I have no clue. Um, and if you are qualified to be then pardoned, you have to pledge in writing that you regret what it is that you've done. Otherwise, you won't be freed. No. Yes. So yeah. it comes with a series of... Oh, bullshit. Essentially yeah. bullshit. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is I just thought it was very timely that they decided to announce this but on But you the know Eve. what pissed me off is the, it's a, obviously it's a PR move. Yeah. Well, that's and the media was, picks it up. <clears throat> I mean, it's, I, it's like immediately, it, it, you know, it's like the hijab thing from a couple months ago where the media goes, oh, you know, the, uh, um, Supreme Leader Khamenei says that the people will be pardoned. And that's and so the, the feel of the story becomes things are going to you know, they're going to moderate things in Iran. Everything's going to be all right. It's propaganda with the regi- for the regime on the anniversary of the Islamic Revolution. That the Western media eats up. Yep. Unfortunately. Yeah. What can I say? Yeah. What can you say? It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and there were those images of him with the young girls. No. Like, just. <laughs> it's, 
it's it's a, it's dear leader. It's North Korea. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Exactly. So the okay the pardon. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know who that's. For. I mean, yeah, I don't even know what they're. But as I said in my essay, it's like the fact that. They can't. I, I don't like that the that the PR seems to be eaten up by the the, the media. Mm-hmm. But 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 it also suggests to me that they are really on the run and confused. Yes. How do you go from we will execute you to we will pardon, pardon. you? I mean, it's uh, you know, Jafar Panahi. We will detain you. Okay, we will release you. I mean, there there's a lot of confusion mm-hmm. going on, and and that speaks to instability. Yeah, clearly for sure. Um, Speaking about um, Western media and them eating up, you know, things like this, I wanted to talk about um, something that's going to be taking place at the UN this okay. month. Yeah. So um, on the 27th of February, there is a UN Human Rights Council taking place. And unfortunately, the foreign minister of the Islamic oh, Republic right. is going to be it's in Geneva. Speak. Yeah, he's Yeah, he's right. going to be, not only is he going to be in Geneva and attending this, right. he's actually going to address the opening right. of this. So... You know, we've talked about this so many times where it's you remove the Islamic Republic from the woman's, I can't even remember what it was committee, called, the committee yeah, or yeah, whatever. whatever. And yeah. then on, on one hand, you do that. And then on the yeah. other, you have the foreign minister speaking, speaking and at the UN and Human opening, Rights Council. Yeah. And not just speaking, opening the UN Human Rights Council. Yeah. So there's a call to action in place to have um, representatives from from all different countries walk out when this happens. Um, And specifically, the call to action is being emphasized for the foreign ministers from France, Germany, and the UK. And the reason for that is last year, um, when the foreign minister of Russia Mm. did the same, um, Sergei Lavrov, Lavrov, yeah, yeah, um, those individuals were actually the first to get up and leave. So hopefully we'll see that happen, Um, but yeah. I wanted to definitely mention Jeez. that as yet another. Thanks, UN. Uh, yeah. And finally, uh, we should mention that this weekend, uh, I, we'll talk a bit more about this on Thursday, but mm-hmm. big global day of action, February yes. 11th. Uh, coming from all sides. You know, there's. I'm seeing uh, everybody's jumping on this. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, um, th- there's going to be a big action in Paris. Yep. I know there's some folks who are really working hard to make Los Angeles the biggest demonstration in history. Mm-hmm. I know that we're going to have one here in Toronto that's going to yep. be big, all over the world. And I thought uh, um, that Reza Pahlavi put out that statement saying, come on, everybody, on February 11th, mm-hmm. uh, um, no matter who you support, what you, and I saw other sort of leaders of our um, diaspora uh, echoing that as well. Yeah. So hopefully it'll be a big day of action on the 11th. Yeah, mm. I mean, it, it's looking to be. There's There's been so much conversation and so much planning around it and more and more cities are signing up to be part of that day. So yeah. Before going to, to guess about the uh, earthquake in Turkey, uh. I want to just mention something that which is related to because last week also we had an earthquake in Troy, yeah. and still people are are suffering mm-hmm. there. And <laughs> meanwhile, the Iranian regime uh, suggested Turkey to go oh there and help gosh. people there. So, oh my God, <laughs> yeah. so they won't help their own people, yeah. Yeah. and they'll refuse help from Turkey, yes. but they're willing to go over yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, some of this stuff you don't have to. We could just make it up. We could. I mean, we, could, we <laughs> no, not make it up, but we could. Yeah. We could get. We no, just just imagine the worst scenario, yes. and that's what they do. I know? honestly don't even think I could make up something half as ridiculous as this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it happened. <laughs> speaking of which, after serving won the Grammy. The uh, like head of the Khanemus there. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, I was actually wondering if the regime had any reaction. <laughs> yeah, no. oh. He said that uh, b- by like by s- singing this kind of song that is against your people, you <laughs> would you would like uh, you would deprive yourself from earning a Fajr oh. uh, award. So, <laughs> oh <laughs> my. There is no end yeah. to this joke. This kind of song that is against your people, the lyrics of which are made up from written by the people. Written by the people, yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> thank you, Pega. Thank, thank you, Shia. You. Uh, looking forward to our first guest. Let me get to my first guest today. He is an Australian-Iranian rising star actor and producer and the recipient of the prestigious Heath Ledger Scholarship. Mojan Arya was born and raised in Sydney, Australia. So you may have seen his talents in such films as Dead Lucky, Danger Close, The Battle of Long Tan, The Last Manhunt, Reminiscence, and The Enforcer, where he has shared the big screen with the likes of Antonio Banderas, Jason Momoa, and Hugh Jackman. Uh, Mojan started uh, the first ever scholarship at the Australian Institute for the Performing Arts for Middle Eastern, young Middle Eastern and North African actors. His latest film, Shayda, in which he co-stars with Zad Amir Ebrahimi, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival last month. It won a prestigious audience award, and he's been very vocal and active about the ongoing revolution in Iran and right now. Mojan Arya joins me from Los Angeles today. Hello, sir. Salam, salam. I'm so happy to be here and talk to you. And yeah. Really nice to have you on the show, Mojan. And, and congratulations are in order. I mean, you've just returned from the Sundance Film Festival, where the film that you've been involved in, and you're one of the stars, uh, Shayda, not only debuted, but was the winner of the Audience Award in the World Cinema Dramatic Competition. Uh, how did that feel? Yeah, tears were shed. Um, battles were won in a way. Uh, you know, it felt very monumental. I guess would be the word that I would use. Um, you know, and I was sort of congratulating anyone in the Iranian diaspora community. You know, when they were congr congratulating me, I was telling them congratulations back um, because I truly felt like it was a a win for all of us um, for for a bunch of reasons. You know, to touch on, I guess Iranian cinema is you know very un underrepresented um and if it is it's it's primarily iranian movies made within iran mm. which have to sort of su support and have allegiance to that regime um and then so the films outside of that regime being made are not often given the same sort of support uh so when you know a film does do well outside of that infrastructure it's sort of a win for so many reasons so many people and to be at sundance and you know um yeah you know we didn't win anything from the from the jury you know and i was really disappointed and i was um you know sort of just gutted thinking wow not an iranian film not winning anything from the jury again with with the opening night film mm. uh, but then when we won the audience award yeah tears were shed because i guess you know there's a there's a thousands and thousands of people that go to sundance and they're not many of them are not iranian but to yeah. show that we got the audience of vote the people's vote um by mainly non-iranians who care about us and care about our stories um, and it, it, it's even more mind blowing when you think there's only two audience awards for narrative features and both went to Iranian mm. diaspora movies this time. Um, I cried when they won as well. Um, lots of tears were shed. They cried when we won. Everyone was everyone, <laughs> everyone was, you was know, crying. Well, you know, screaming it, Iran at the red carpet. It was unbelievable. I've never experienced that. Well, uh, let me ask. I'm going to ask you about that. But it's it's so <laughs> interesting that you should describe this as a as a collective win for Iranians because I think it's a function of the moment we're in, um, the historic moment what we're in globally, that it really does feel that way. I mean, I I see you winning that prize and I take pride in it as if I have something to do with your film, which. Of course, I don't, and it and it and it's it reminds me of Shervin last night upon winning the yeah. Grammy Award, posting, you know, we won, not I won, we won, yeah. and that's the way Iranians felt, like we won. You know, of course, we're deferring to him; it's his song, but we we all want to own it. What was the atmosphere like at Sundance for an Iranian film? that you were in and worked on in the middle of all that's going on with the ongoing uprising. Um, you know, it, it was, it was very, it was very intense, um, for so many reasons. Uh, one, because we know that, I mean, for those that don't know, Sundance Film Festival is the biggest independent film festival in the world. And it dictates a lot of the market. Um, and many of the great filmmakers, whether it's Tarantino or Paul Thomas Anderson have been launched at Sundance. And so it's sort of this, 
uh, epicenter where the industry gets together and sort of decides what's next in a way. It, it, it does feel that way. Yeah. Um, and it was very intense because, you know, there were six Iranian films at Sundance, which was unprecedented, mm-hmm. whether it was, you know, in, you know, Persian version, U.S. dramatic competition, my film, Shada, an international competition, a great documentary called Junam in um, documentary competition, a beautiful film by Bob Jalali about an Afghan refugee in America in New Voices and then two short films. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the buyers don't know us, you know, so, and the industry doesn't know our stories. We're not Italian Americans that have been sort of distinct in the Hollywood system or Jewish Americans right. or African Americans or Korean Americans that sort of have this narrative, you know, in, for, for us, we're, we're Argo, but the supporting characters in the background, you know, um, so it was it was intense, and of course it's intense because on on one hand also we're sort of celebrating this monumental you know situation, but we're also trying to use this momentum to put wind in our sails to spotlight this revolution, mm-hmm. um, which has you know been been tricky you know to say the least. But not, not not to mention you don't want to be seen chugging oysters and celebrating. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. No smiling and right. you know no laughing because. You know, you don't want to be. It's just a very, you know, it's 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 tough. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, you're dealing with Iranians in all different films. So you're dealing with people from different political backgrounds, different religious backgrounds. So then, you know, there's yeah. sensitivity even among our community there. Um, so it was it was difficult to navigate. But all that being said, it was. I, I was just. I didn't sleep for ten days. I was just so happy and so proud. I saw the other Iranian films. I couldn't believe it. Um, we had an Iranian breakfast at Sundance. Wow. Um, you know, that was, you know, supported by UIA and Shiva over there did an amazing job. She was a part of helping spotlight the Grammys last night. She was at the Grammys and passing out free Iran pins. Um, and we had, you know, uh, Iranians in film and television. This new organization, sort of spotlighting Iranian artists, and well, we you were Iranian- you were part of the first ever Iranian filmmakers event at Sundance, and I, I, I yeah, I, I saw some video of it. I, I mean, I've been to Sundance before. I would not have believed we would ever see that. Uh, tell tell me no, tell me, me about the atmosphere around that event. Yeah, me. Either. It's about sort of you know what it becomes about. It's about really bringing in the non-Iranians to understand that because primarily, you know, the Iranian diaspora that's been successful in America um, or in the West has been successful sort of hiding their identity, Mm. right? In a a way, not leading with their identity. So it's sort of, you know, saying, hey, listen, like, you know, we are the people that gave you Rumi and Hafez and Shams and, you know, like, we are not just the people who can build the infrastructure for you, but you know, with the right support, you know, we, you know, we can give you our own Scorseses and Coppolas and Spike Lees, and we can give you our own of those people if you just believe in us. We've been doing this art thing for thousands of years. Yes, we're 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 pretty good at it. Um, and if you believe in our stories, like you believed in the African American stories as of late, which you never thought you would. And if you believe in the Korean American stories as you have of late, which we never thought you would, um, you know, we're sort of the last ones um, that really haven't been supported in the same way. Yeah. So it's sort of about, you know, shedding light on those, on those topics. Um, and yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's so interesting because that's been an ongoing fight, you know, but now there's also concomitantly this revolution happening uh, in Iran. And I, it's always a bit of a paradox because on the one hand, we don't want to rely on Westerners or celebrities or something to enable a revolution that should be about Iranians, you know, creating the change uh, themselves. But on the other hand, we know what makes a difference. Uh, What was the, 
what was the conversation among non-Iranians who would come and talk to you or your fellow castmates, et cetera, um, about in terms of, first of all, how much did they know about this mo- this pivotal moment right now of what's going on in Iran and, and how, how, how much support did you feel? I mean, they, they don't know much, but they, but, but they know of it, which is, which is enough to sort of start a conversation. Um, it's the same thing where it's like, I'm so sorry what's happening in Iran. Do you have family then? I'm like, yes, all my family. And they're like, okay, um, it's terrible what they're doing to the women there. And it's like, it is terrible what they're doing to the women there. That's just one centimeter of the issue. Um, and, you know, and they're like, yeah, you know, it's so sad all the women being killed there. And I'm like, yes, the women are being killed there. Lots of men have been killed there. And they're like, really? So it's about yeah. sort of beginning this sort of conversation for them to sort of understand, um, you know, just to raise awareness, to be able to give support. You know, these are really powerful people that have a lot of ties to media. Um, they can sort of very, you know, be able to spotlight us at the Academy, at the Golden Globes, you know, last night at the Grammys, in media. Um, so you sort of have to, you know, kind of abide by them and, you know, cater to them a little bit and sort of take care of their needs. Um, but, you know, it's it's in my first time since, you know, I'm, I'm young, I'm, you know, 30 years old. And it's in my first time of my life where, I'm ever hearing the Iranian people mm. and then something positive, you know, in the sense of yep. they're so brave, you know what I mean? Like, which is, which is great because usually that has not been the case. Let me come back to that. I just, before I leave Sundance though, at the topic of Sundance, I have to say, I mean, the other thing about Sundance is um, famously, you know, it's in Utah. It's, it's, I mean, it's this great independent festival that, as you say, sets the agenda to a certain extent for the rest of the world. But it, it has traditionally, or in its beginnings, I, I always thought of it as a very Mar- American, you know, uh, film festival. Robert Redford started it. It was in yeah. the heart of America. And, and, yeah. I hear a story about like at three in the morning, you and a bunch of other Iranians at Sundance dancing to an Iranian DJ. I mean, it just, it just, it must have felt surreal to a certain extent. Oh, it was so surreal. Like it was, you know, we were, we were slated as the opening night film um, to open the international competition section, which was already this gigantic honor. And we kind of premiered and people were, really taken back from our film, if I'm not mistaken. I think right now we're still at 100% of Rotten Tomatoes wow. and been really well received. And um, and we were at the after party, which they brought in an Iranian DJ for us. This, um, you know, beautiful after party. And it's stacked with sort of, you know, a lot of notable people from the industry. And it's three in the morning and I'm leaving one section of the after party and I'm seeing all these, you know, Iranians in, you know, in exile, people like Zab, you know, dancing with Iranian diaspora, which have always felt so separate and sort of, you know, American, you know, studio heads <laughs> trying to sort of shoulder shimmer. Of course, there's a lot of just white people standing in the corner scared, but it's at the same time just so beautiful to see, um, so so beautiful to see that coming. And, you know, that was the most impactful moment of my night. Not necessarily the premiere of the film and the reception of the film, but I just remember looking at that window into that world for that yeah. moment and seeing what the future could look like. Yeah, um, and that has really seared into my memory. That's really inspiring. Let, let me let me ask you a bit about you, because for some people listening to this or watching that 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 this is an introduction. I mean, you are. You're a child of the diaspora, like me, Iranian, but in your case, born and raised in Sydney, and not uh, here in Canada. Did did you identify strongly as an Iranian growing up, or were you somewhat, as I was, in the ethnic closet, and in your case, trying to be Australian? Well, my parents were very Iranian, like you know, really Iranian, um, and very proud to be Iranian. Um, you know, my father ended up going back to Iran when I was quite young because he couldn't really assimilate to Australian culture. 
Um, and my mother was very proud. I ended up staying in Australia. My mother was very proud of her Iranian roots. So my home could not be more Iranian. Mm. You know, it was unbelievable how Iranian it is. I just, I think it's, 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 it's comical. But outside of my home, you know, you know, growing up at high school, there was, um, I don't know if people are aware, but they can just Google the Cronulla riots. Um, and there was race riots happening in Australia that shut down Sydney for some time of um, white people beating up Middle Eastern people, Middle Eastern people beating up white people, and ended up shutting down the whole city. A lot of people don't know this. And, you know, it, it was not cool to be um, Iranian, to say the least. And And I, you know, was in the acting world at quite a young age, which had no Iranians or Middle Eastern people in it at all in Australia. So I, I did go through that stage of working very hard to blend in, um, you know, but I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't quite uh, hide, you know what I mean? Mm. So I, I did go through that and, but I had a very impactful experience. I was at a, you know, really prestigious drama school called NIDA, the National Institution of Dramatic Arts that, um, you know, Kate Blanchett and so studied. And I was doing Shakespeare and Strindberg and Ibsen. I was doing all these kind of master playwrights and writers. And I was just one day being like, I, I don't feel like my fullest self, you know? And I remember when I started learning our poetry from our place, um, it kind of clicked, you know, something clicked for me, uh, you know, how I can sort of utilize that mm. work you know, in English and, and bring that spirit of that work into what I do. Um, so it's been a journey to sort of. Did, it, did, guess, did, did, did anyone yeah. ever tell you to change your name? I did change my name. Yeah. When oh, I first did. came to Hollywood. Yeah. 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 When I first came to Hollywood, I mean, no, no, my, my birth name is Mujan, but when I first came to Hollywood, um, yeah, I mean, I was constantly told to change my name. And at, at one point I met a very powerful manager um, who, sat me down and wanted to represent me and said, but your name's never going to work and gave me a list of names. And I ended up having this fake name and it would be called at meetings and I would sort of sit there and I'd be like, Oh, that's me. Yeah. And people would be like, Oh, there's something wow. wrong with this, 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 this kid. Um, and yeah, all of that, you know, hide people telling me to hide my ethnic background or things like that. And I mean, that has gone on, you know, Till this day, you know, mm. that, that that hasn't stopped. And even, you know, Iranians of note that are sort of super successful in this business, maybe in the studio sense, are always like, you know, when we meet with them and I say, oh, I want to make something Iranian-American, for instance, they're like, but you've worked with all these people. Like, you've made it now. Like, you don't, <laughs> right. why? Like, right. You don't want to get, yeah. yeah. get away from the Iranians. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? um, it's a generational thing, um, but it's, I don't, I don't think, you know, the road can go down that it can't go very far that way um and i you know you you start to feel you know empty if you're if you're in denial you know yeah. and i sort of think about you know my favorite actor um robert de niro mm. and i sort of think about okay you know italy has just as rich of a culture as iran if not we have more so Italy has less people than Iran. Um, you know, it, Italians were, you know, very much ostracized in the history of America. Um, and they were very much appropriated for a long time. Yeah. And, but they were able to bound together and make these small films that shed light on their culture. And then they were able to get more momentum to make bigger yeah. films. And then, you know, if you look at the whole cinematic la landscape, they have many of the greatest films, you know, in, in cinematic history, of course, just in this little Italian American Bronx or, or 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 Queens or situation, which is so specific, you know. And I think, whoa, why can't we have that? But I'm I'm, I'm just thinking about what you're saying, and I'm and I'm reflecting on it, and it is such a, it, it, to be honest, it's a bit of a devastating contradiction that that we live as Ivanians because of course on the one hand there's this especially with the older generations there's this profound pride and and commitment we are Iranian and you know that 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 sort of undertone of we invented everything and you know all yeah, of yeah, that yeah. um but on the other hand you're right it's this it's this uh 
uh, Mojan, you're you're too good to be working with Iranians. I, 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 you know, people say this at least once every couple of weeks to me. Somebody in the Iranian community will go, "Well, you're a really good interviewer. So why are you working with Iranians? Why are you trying to, you know, as if I, uh, um, which which is uh, sad and and um, you kind of think, well, if Mojan is not going to work with Iranians because he's too good. How are we ever going to turn around this cycle, right? Uh, um, how are we ever going to, uh, you, you know, own it? Uh, it's a weird and and sad contradiction. Maybe the last few months changes all of that in terms of this rebirth of, of pride we're feeling. But I can completely understand and relate to, to how you've been approached that way. Yeah, I just think, you know, we don't have an understanding of our own power. And I think that's what sort of you know, systemic racism does for a long period of time. You know, it's not just Iran, but the Middle East has been divided and conquered for so long, you know, and it's been very, it's very been purposefully um, set up in a way that Iranians turn on each other. Oh, these are Iranian Jews. No, these are, these are these Muslims. These are Baha'is. These are Christians. These are, you know, oh no, they're from the Paris. They're, they're the French Iranians. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's like there's just so many reasons for us to hate on each other. Um, and, you know, I think that's slowly going away when, you know, you know, it's become spotlighted that we at least have this sort of common enemy. Yes. But I, I mean, look, I, at the same time, you're simply not going to make as much money or attract as much stardom or have as lavish a life in an Iranian art house movie as you are going to be in a James Cameron film, right? I mean, that's the, the reality. Yeah, of I mean, it's, it's, it's a reality that I don't necessarily um, agree with mm -hmm. that because it is a reality if you're looking at it, you know, in that sense. But then I think, okay, you know, you know, you think about a movie like Goodfellas, how well that does. But that started with a movie like Mean Streets. And who is Spike Lee if he says, oh, I don't want to tell African-American stories or with African-American characters. We don't get do the right thing, which leads us getting yeah. Malcolm X and then the birth of Denzel yeah. Washington and Viola Davis. And they go on to have these empires. Um, and I do think, you know, just there is something about... Um, about being true to yourself and you know we have to think that you know Rumi is the most bought poet or one of the most bought poets in a, in, in America yeah so that's that's financial <laughs> you know and right. and that's not a money that any Iranians are seeing by the way that's translations done by you know American mm -hmm. historians but you know it's it's Rumi's more read in this country than Walt Whitman yeah so I don't think we should sort of say that I don't know if I tell my own stories and I eventually become in a position to maybe tell something, let's just say hypothetically, based on the Sean no Omer, mm -hmm. if it can't be as successful as Avatar. And you're so, it's such a profound point. I grew up watching every Spike Lee film every single thing this man does uh, not to mention you know Scorsese and the Italian stuff uh, uh, and and you, you would you know you could say well why would why would a Iranian Canadian kid middle class kid growing up in it be interested in Spike Lee films that are about uh, African Americans it, uh, it's the same argument uh, why why can't the world be interested in in Iranian stories in Iranian films in Iranian and and the starting point being Rumi I mean it's a very profound a simple but profound point you're making i i think it's an excellent one well they've proven already statistically that like these african-american stories or african stories that are doing so well is not purely based on the african-american market right. it's not just the audience right. right right um it's primarily actually white people going and see these movies at the theater um and you know you see movies like you know even even heightened comic book versions like Black Panther, you see what they're able to do in China right, and things right. like that. I mean, um, if or, something or, is or, or the fascination in the West right now with anything, you know, Asian, Korean, uh, oh, Japanese Korean, yeah. art, Korean is you know, so, yeah. it's so, Korean cinema is just, I think, one of the best right now. It's yeah. not the best. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And 
um, yeah, I don't think people would, you know, know that we would have this Minari and then, you know, Squid Game and, you know, Parasite and just in, in every artistic tier, commercial tier. Um, it's it's beautiful to see because it's it's filmmakers, artists, producers and writers being true to themselves. Mm. In terms you know, of Mojan, in terms of the heart and pride and passion that we're hearing from you right now about being Iranian, um, you know, when you, I mean, you're a kid who was born in Sydney. You grew up in Australia. Yeah. You, when when you won that that Heath Ledger scholarship, a very prestigious scholarship in, tw in 2017, you paid tribute to your Iranian heritage and gave this appreciation for your mother, Mariam. I watched the video of your your acceptance speech, and you actually break down as you're talking about her. Um, t tell us a bit about her and why why in that moment you wanted to talk about her and be so grateful for this Iranian mom who uh, escaped Iran. Oh, it makes me emotional to sort of even think about it, but, you know, that was, I would still say, the defining moment of my life in a lot of ways. Um, I was very... I had, I had some success till then, but I was I was really just struggling um, in LA. I, I there was no sort of identity of an actor that I looked up to in any way that existed in, in in Australia. So I packed my bags and I first came to America by myself at a really young age. And by the time I won that Heath Ledger scholarship, I was about twenty five years old, and it's. For, uh, yeah, Americans will get confused about scholarship, but sort of this award. Um, mm. And I'd been a finalist two years in a row, which was already a huge thing. Uh, but I had no agents, I had no managers, I had no idea of what to do in my career next. And the judging panel consisted of Gary Oldman and, you know, people that I really looked up to. Yeah. Um, and I had very impactful mentors from the year before who were finalists who told me privately that I should stop putting so much hope in this institution. You know, this institution would never select anybody with my name. Hmm. And it was very heartbreaking because I was like, okay, but what, what am I going to do? Um, it felt like I had no it's a, other... It's a, uh, Heath Ledger was obviously Australian. It's, a, it's an Australian yeah. kind of um, institution? Or? that... Yeah, it's, it's, it's an Australian institution, um, and it's a, Heath's family, there's sort of a board from Australians in film, um, this organization, and what they would call like Heath's friends, people like Gary Oldman and, and whatnot. Um, you know, there's been a lot of prestigious judges. Mm. A part of it, Naomi Watts was one of my judges, um, give an award to celebrate and support a young Australian actor one a year um and you know i think like fourteen thousand people apply or something like that you know and it is like a really quite big award because you know they help them get managers agents set them up um fund them um and yeah when i when i when I won, you know, and the other people that I was competing with that year were quite known. And I remember one of them in particular had Vogue at the award ceremony covering her. And there was like all this press there and I was sort of sat in the corner alone. And you just assume, okay, like, this is your seating position. Like, obviously you're not, they know. And, right. you know, when I, I had, when I had won, I really had no idea. And I was, life sort of stopped and, um, and then I th sort of thanked everyone and then I thought, oh, wait, who have I not thanked? And, and it hit me like a ton of bricks that, you know, the reason why I'm even here at all is because of my mother. So, yeah, that was very intense because she was very, you know, she grew up in Iran. She always wanted to be in the arts. That was taken away from her. She was, you know, married at a very young age. She didn't grow up wealthy, your mom. She didn't grow up wealthy. She, 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 she was married at a very young age and, you know, they came to Australia without, you know, a lot of support and, you know, through a lot of, you know, I won't say a lot of things because they're personal, but let's just say through a lot of unbelievable ob obstacles, 
um, she never let me have anything less than anyone else. So that was one moment there where I was thinking, you know, I really should thank her, and I did. It was, it's a beautiful moment uh, and, and emotion-filled. Um, and fast forward to five years, six years later, you've been very involved in this revolution. Uh, you're speaking at rallies, you're moderating panels. Uh, Mojan, has it surprised you how much you've been involved? Yeah, you know, um, sometimes I feel too involved. You know, I feel I feel too pulled into it. Um, and I, you know, have sort of let a lot of other things slip by me. Um, and, but it just feels like if we're ever going to get our country back, um, this is the only time to do it. What does and it mean? That, what does it mean to be too pulled into it? It just means that my whole days and I go like a whole month of connecting people to speak, connecting different types of influential people, reaching out to journalists to do the stories properly, you know, pulling my weight through, you know, influential people I know if people mm. have done incorrect stories to get their stories corrected. Um, you know, having people of note with huge followings like Jason Momoa and whatnot, post about things, reshare things, um, letting sort of, if, if I'm releasing a movie, letting the PR people know, hey, about what's happening and that we're going to spotlight this mm -hmm. and, um, you know, how, how to just, it goes on and on how to make stories about this and it, it becomes very um, encompassing. Sure, yeah. You know, and I sort of be like, wait, I never considered myself an activist and you know now everyone's like hey this is Mojan the actor and activist and right. I'm like the activist <laughs> and oh I'm the activist <laughs> right you know like so um I you know it's it's become this sort of you know really intense situation and and also very stressful because if it's about my acting um and I make a mistake you know that's on me Mm. You know what I mean? But if it's on, if it's about my activism in the situation and I make a mistake, well, it, it affects a lot of people and mm. it impacts a lot of people, you know, and the situation in, you know, in Iran at one point now I feel like we're very clear, but at one point felt like it was changing minute by minute. Mm. Um, when you say, when, when you say if we don't take our country back now, uh, meaning Iran, we may never get this opportunity again. Do you do you believe we are doing everything we should be doing or can be doing to enable this opportunity? No, I, no. I think it. Uh, you know, I think that you know the world is 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 quick to forget and 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 quick to move on. You know, we have the whole world watching Iran right now. Um, and I do think that every time I think, oh, we're sort of slipping away from the media's attention, boom, Shevin wins a Grammy, you know, which which sounds like a joke, yeah. but really isn't because it, it, it sort of spotlights us again and gives us another reason to be unified. Um, you know, I do think, you know, we should be working harder to, to get this um, Islamic Republic guard on the terrorist list. Um, and 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 lobbying for that in our different countries, and I, you know, I do think, you know, we should be working harder to sort of think about, okay, how is this regime going to get out? Because they've now proven that they're going to be, um, you know, they're, they're going to sort of stronghold themselves. They're mm. going to execute, and they they're not going to give that much breathing room, um, and they're not they're not to be negotiated with. Um, and how are we going to really get them out? And then I guess the third thing is, you know, who is going to be our leader? Um, or just what is the next plan? You know what I mean? I think that's really, you mm -hmm. know, important. I think mm -hmm. those are three good action steps that we could be doing better on. When I think about Sydney, Australia, where you grew up, um, I know that there's an Iranian community there, uh, um, I have friends who've grown up there. I actually have family in in, in Sydney. Um, 
and uh, but I didn't quite know how large and um, enthusiastic the community is until I saw these recent demonstrations in Sydney with 10,000 people and it was like wow represent this is pretty cool um, how have you seen the Iranian and actually uh, truth be told we've talked about this a few times on the show one of our largest pockets of audience for this program is actually in Sydney Australia that's how I knew there was a, a big percentage of Iranians there um, but what 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 can you tell us about the community there and how you've seen it grow or change since you were a kid? I mean, the community that is 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 incredible. Um, really, just really beautiful in a way that I've never sort of seen another community um, anywhere else in the world, to be honest. And I think there's a reason for that, and the primarily primary reason is. There's Iranians in my parents' generation who are like, you know, you and, you know, your parents and came after me and you and came after the the revolution, everything like that. Um, but there's this new group of refugees mm. uh, that have actually, you know, and there's many of them. You know, I think Australia has 15,000 refugees right now that are in limbo waiting for their resident status, many of which are Iranian, that have actually come to Australia by boat. So, which, you know, you can't come to America by boat, you can't come to Canada by right. boat, you can't go to London by boat, you can't go to France by boat, um, I don't think at least. So, we have this population of very, you know, intense um, Iranian refugees. And when I use the word intense, I mean these are people that are artists, mm. that are often prolific journalists that have had to literally pack their bags, flee in the middle of the night in Iran, right. end up in Turkey, go through the like smuggler route. Like these are award-winning filmmakers, some right. of which I've become friends with and I'm working with, and that have ended up in Indonesia, paid human smugglers in Indonesia, got on a raft, which many do not survive, ended up in Australia, been thrown in prison in, in the detention system, been terribly mistreated, and eventually after some 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 time um have been able to you know go out um and participate in somewhat of an existence while they're still waiting for their residency card you know a lot of the you know you know a lot of the iranians in australia are still waiting for their residency card and right. their citizenship which is you know evil um you know it's evil yeah. we give it to a lot of people and so um, these are people who actually are needed, who benefit society in tremendous ways. Yeah. And they can't really live in freedom um, because they sort of seen if they do one thing wrong, they can lose their status. Mm -hmm. Can't really, you know, relax. Um, and they're just incredible. You know, they're just, you know, incredible people. My mom has, you know, an Iranian restaurant in Sydney. And, you know, a lot of refugees have sort of come there and over the years and, you know, got gotten their first jobs in Australia from her and wow. am amazing musicians play music at the restaurant. And um, so what, growing up in Sydney, you know, there wasn't this, we didn't really have an area, right? Like a, I guess like a little Italy or something right. that had this yeah. only Tor Toronto, there's an area, Toronto an area. and it's, yeah, it's, yes. yeah. Now in Sydney, there's an area. Mm. where you go and it's like i'm like wait every sign is in iranian um you know everything is iranian and it's traditional and awesome and it's this hybrid iranian australian culture um that's sort of happening so it's a really an Amer it's a really an amazing um community and you should get down there i'd love to sort of have you there um i go often and you know if you have an audience of um, Iranian Australians there. That's that's telling because yeah, I think uh, it's our it's our eleventh biggest cities are something like our our eleventh yeah. biggest city. Uh, they're very city. true. They're very yeah. like they they're really intense and they really know what's accurate. They're very tapped into what's happening in Iran. Um, the protests in Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane and Canberra and you know uh, my friends Ali Vaziri, Shion Askari. You know they're really pushing it in a very in intense way there. Um, so, yeah. so, so full circle to where we started with Sundance. And it, it occurs to me that, um, 
you know, not to overdo the conversation about identity and Mojan, but you're not just an Iranian in, 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 in Hollywood. You're an Iranian who grew up in Australia. I mean, I see you speaking at these rallies in, in, in LA, uh, yeah. and you've been embraced by the American Iranian community, it seems, in Southern California. That must yeah. be interesting for an Australian kid as well, right? Yeah, that is that is super interesting. You know, I mean, I guess one thing I will touch on, it's, I mean, now the Iranian community in Australia has changed. But when I was growing up, you know, the Iranian community and the Middle Eastern community had sort of bounded together and they didn't have the best, I would say, reputation in Australia. Um, that sort of changed, has, has changed as of late with this influx of new Iranians. But they didn't have the best rep- reputation. There was pockets of crime and, and, and things like that. Um, and so when I was, you know, telling us people in Australia, oh, I'm, I'm Iranian, you know, people were like, oh, people could be scared of Iranian people. Um, hmm. But in LA, you know, when you tell people you're Iranian, they're like, oh, do you live in Beverly Hills? Are you rich? And I'm right. like, wow, this is, this is a different yeah. stereotype to be aligned with. Right. Um, but but uh, it's sort of, you know, that being said, there's a lot of Iranians here that I've been completely blown away by in terms of how culturally impactful they are, um, you know, whether they're sort of art collectors and just their, their know about um, arts and history and the industry. And, they're you know, they've been proud of me, I guess, um, in a way they've been able to see my success outside of the Iranian community. Mm-hmm. Um, and they want me to be more embedded in the Iranian community and, you know, great um, Iranian women like Bito Melanion, who sort of have been a part of hosting, you know, putting together a lot of the protests and mm-hmm. events and the Iranians and film and television things have been introducing me to the Iranian community. And I've got to meet, you know, I would say all the Iranian actors and people like that of note here that are sort of have come from exile and mm. short and all the people and sort of be able to be right. with my community. Right, right. Yeah, you, you, let me before, before I let you go. I, I want to bring back something you were talking about too, in terms of represent, representation for Iranians um, in in Hollywood, in film and TV. I mean, the truth is, you've actually played American roles in most of your career. If I look at your yeah, IMDb, I've never played an Iranian role until this last week. Right. and and you've yeah. wanted to create more Iranian roles in Hollywood, and and yeah. and I I'll, I'll I'll never stop whining about. You know, um, Jake Gyllenhaal playing the Prince of Persia. Like you couldn't find a Persian. You know, so uh, so given that we have the worst representation, I think, in the business, right? In terms of Iranians in, yeah. in film and TV, how do you how do you change that? Um, well, I'll, I'll give you some statistics. So, first of all, in the Iranian, uh, you know, pocket, you know. You know, big thanks to a woman named Azita Ghanizadeh. That's an Afghan American. Yes, she's woman. been on the program. Yeah. Oh yes, um, who sort of started the MENA, you know, advocacy coalition, and they gave us the Middle East and North African box. So at least we can prove that we have an identity, <laughs> because before that we couldn't really pr- prove that we had an identity. It's African Americans, Asian Americans, everything else. So, you know, I think in 2022, from the top 252. Um, movies of the year there was no meaner person that was a lead no meaner female filmmaker and no meaner writer so where i think 0.04 percent representation all 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 around so it, it's 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 atrocious mm. to say the least yeah. um i think a lot of a lot of things need to happen for that to change i think number one we have to sort of um you know, educate the non-Iranian community on us, on why we matter, on our stories, on who we are as people, which is what this, the upside of this revolution has Mm -hmm. sort of led to. Um, The other thing is uniting the Iranian community so there can be stop, stop being so much division so we can work together, right? And not sort of ostracizing people. Easier said than done, but yes. Easier said than done, but that's another thing that is sort of, I would say, although some of the aspects of this revolution are dividing people, I would say it's more unifying than yes. dividing. Yes. Um, and the the other thing is like Iranians of wealth, right? Who you know we have it in our community where you know a lot of Iranian uh, you know wealth 
collect uh, art collectors and things like that or wealthy people who sort of be like oh i want to you know i'm gonna finance this um this 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 art italian art sculpture you know what i mean for them to sort of put the money back into our community right, right. um and that's sort of the big thing which you know is a, is an education process and as a support process right. um and then showing i mean at Sundance, the fact that Iranian diaspora movies won both audience awards mm. is proof enough to the market. Um, you know, uh, Persian version just sold to Sony Pictures Classics, you know, which is a huge, yeah. huge achievement. You know, they did um, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, Call Me yeah. By Your Name. They do really yeah. big films, Sony Pictures Classics. And now they're distributing this Iranian film worldwide we'll have news about Shada soon, which I wish I could tell you, but I can't, but it's it's of equal importance. Wow. Um and you know, so that is that is big proving to the market. So all those things coming together is what's gonna create um this this change that'll give us our own Spike Lees and Coppolas yeah. and, you know, Scorsese's and Pacinos and De Niro's and Washington's and what so so on and so forth, Violet Davis's. Well, Jan, it's really great to talk to you. I appreciate you. Let me let me end with a maybe it's a existential question. I don't know. You see if you can um, grapple with it. But but jumping off from what you just called the upside of yes. this revolution and what's happening in terms of awareness, I mean, and whether it's the way you're talking about Hollywood waking up to Iranian stories or. Shervian winning a Grammy. Uh, it does feel like there is this unprecedented moment for those of us in the diaspora who have either felt invisible as Iranians or typecast or stereotyped over the years. Uh, what is it like for you personally to be living this moment? It feels um, like a responsibility because I think I speak for a lot of us when I say we you know, depending on your time zone that you're in, you're waking up every day and when you wake up, you hear about another execution. That's the first news you're getting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you understand very clearly had your parents not left that that could have been you. And a part of it, even in a way, wants you to, wants you to be there and participate because you're not on your land. You're not, you're not with your people in a way. Mm. So I think that, you know, in this time, that would be the key word is responsibility. It feels that way, you know, um, you know, when I'm not able to sleep or have so much on my plate. Um, I think that's what keeps me going on is the fact that it's, you know, my responsibility, if not now, when, if not me, who, that sort of thing. And us, all of us. Thank you for uh, all that you're doing. Congratulations again on your new film and the um, the heralding that you received it at Sundance. Uh, I look forward to seeing more of what you do, and I look forward to uh, joining you um, spiritually or literally on the on the demonstrations in the meantime. Thank you for this, Mojan. Merci, Dodosh. I uh, I look forward to listening to more of your podcast and and all of it and. Um, you know, just to give it back to you, I think it's so important that there's a platform that we know of each other in a deeper sense. You know, I used to be proud when I used to meet an, uh, an Iranian person and say, I didn't know that you're Iranian. Now I'm upset that there's that that we don't know each other. Yeah. So the fact that you're spotlighting us and getting us to know each other is just so important and imperative and huge. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Thanks, man. Take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ciao, bye.
All right, this is Rook, episode 236, The Revolution is Evolving. Remember, for all things Rook, our back episodes, uh, our videos, our related content, our different programs, rookmedia.com, where you can also link to our Patreon page. My next guest is an Iranian-German physician, journalist, and author, Gilda Sahibi, was born in Iran, moved to Germany at the age of three. She obtained her education in medicine and political science. And as a journalist, Gilda writes and reports about anti-Semitism, racism, women's rights, and the Middle East with a focus on Iran. Since the beginning of the current uprising in Iran, she has been very outspoken, creating content, guesting on various programs, reporting on the protests, arrests, and executions, and right now. Gilda Sahibi joins me from Berlin today. Hello. Nice to have you back on the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. Um, Gilda, let's start with something positive. Why not? Uh, You posted, uh, as did I, and I think most of the Iranian diaspora, about the Grammy win for Shervin Hajipur last night. Uh, It's undoubtedly an inspired victory, and and we don't want to be anything less than positive about that, but does it actually mean a lot in terms of the the campaign for change, in your view? I don't think you really know at the time what what events really influence things. I think we will know that in, in, in hindsight, but... I think just for spirits, when when uh, Shervin Hajipur posted "We won," it's like it really is a "we." It is. I think it does touch a lot of people in Iran, and I think it's important. And I must say, I was kind of annoyed that in Germany the news media didn't really mention it at all. Like we posted about it and we talked about it because it's this new category, right? It's it's the best song for social change, and I think even beyond Iran, it's something very special and and important. But anyway, yes, I think it is a really, really good thing. And I think people in Iran especially need some high spirits right now. Yeah, that's exactly my thoughts are that, unfortunately, I do think this is the kind of event that means a lot more to Iranians watching with eagle eyes, you know, waiting for that moment and celebrating it than it does for most of the rest of the world that just sees it go go by and waits for the next award for Beyonce or something. Uh, but what it means to us as a global community uh, in terms of raising spirits, I mean, it's uh, just to look at our social media fee- feeds, people really were energized by this. And, and, it, and it speaks to what, you, what you're intimating that this, his song has become something that we all feel a prop- proprietary sense of. Yes, I think especially now because i myself have observed the you know the fights within the community and and not only outside of iran but also inside of iran and and i think it's a very difficult time i think it was different in the beginning where there was more of a unity and more of the just the knowledge that there like there is no revolution without unity it just, it's it's not going to happen right. and you can see that this is kind of breaking apart in some places and people are attacking each other and i think these kinds of events and just anything that brings people together and reminds them of what is actually important i think that's really important right now a friend of mine she was in a twitter space the other day and she told me that they were discussing reza pahlavi and you know all that kind all that stuff that that people are discussing at the moment and then this 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 man came came in from iran and he was like you know we're dying here we're still dying here, even if it's not that much on the news, even if maybe Western media does not report as much as they did in the beginning. It, these things are still happening, and they're happening every day. We have reports about people, you know, being tortured and killed in prisons and so many cases that we don't even hear about. And I, as sad as it is, if that's something that we, we need to remind ourselves of, that this is happening and that this is important, then we should do that. But I think there is nothing more important than unity at the moment. There there were a few things that happened, interestingly enough, over just the last few days that I, I want to put to you because I think they do speak to this idea that I started the show with, that, that this this revolution is maturing, that it's evolving, that it's an evolution, and that it's actually on the right track. There, there was a poll, I'm sure, that you saw that came out on the weekend. Actually, I think you, you posted it on your Instagram from Gaumon Research. This is a nether- 
Netherlands-based survey firm that shows that 81% of respondents, Iranians both inside and outside of Iran, reject the Islamic Republic. How, how much, I guess, first of all, how much can we rely on such polling? And what did you make of those findings? I've known that research institute for a few years now. I, I used their data, I think, three years ago because it's an... an Amar Maliki, he works in that uh, in that institute, and he explained to me back then how they gather their their dat- data. And I think it's back then even I thought, wow, that is just super intelligent of of being able to have independent data from inside of Iran, where there is no independent research institute, and they have these methods with like online asking people online and just these different kinds of questioning methods that I think make the data really reliable. And it just shows the, you know, the things that we've been saying for months or even years that people inside of Iran do not want that Islamic mm-hmm. Republic, mm-hmm. most of them. And I don't know how it's in Canada, but in Germany, we still have, you know, people writing articles and saying, you know, this this movement just has not all the people in it, you know, there's a difference between uh, the the uh, rural regions and, and cities and age differences and these these data show that on the contrary you have like 80 percent beyond the board young people old people academic academics non-academics uh in cities in rural areas everywhere it's all around 80 percent and i think it's really important to have that data also for politicians because it's it really shows that these people and i still believe that they're not going to give up which of course doesn't take away the fact that if even like once this regime falls, it's not going to be an easy path because yeah. people do have different ideas about what's what's going to happen after that, and that that's that poll shows shows that too. Like some people want a constitutional monarchy, some want a presidential republic. There are so many discussions to come, but I think what what is important to focus on now is that. of people don't want the the Islamic Republic, and that's a very, very high number. One of the things I actually liked about the survey, though, is, and and I think gives it credibility, is that it isn't 100%, you know? It's got that 15% in there who support the Islamic Republic inside Iran, and that seems realistic to me. I mean, you know, between Sepa and uh, people in rural regions and whatever. It, we, I thought it was more than that. I would have thought that would be more than 15%. I was, I mean, it's good, <laughs> but I was surprised. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was, I mean, there was also, the poll also shows tremendous support for Reza Pahlavi, both outside and inside Iran. Are you, are you surprised by that? What do you believe that represents? I'm not surprised. I... Because I had my own uh, experience like like two weeks ago because I tried to explain to a German audience about uh, Reza Pahlavi. He was giving an, an interview to Sky News. And I just posted the video and explained there is some controversy about, around him because he's the son of the former uh, dictator of Iran. And my God, did I get a shitstorm. Wow. <laughs> like... But like vicious, really, mm-hmm. really hateful, mm-hmm. vicious comments. And then I I realized what kind of division, potential for division lies with this person. I don't really have an opinion on him. I think if he's able to to uh, rally people behind him and and bring about change and and help, you know, fight this regime, I think that's a good thing. But I am worried about some of his followers because mm. there are some very nationalist, right-wing, even fascist views among them, and that does worry me. It does not really. I'm not really surprised that a lot of people support him, but I am worried about some of his followers who have very, very difficult mm. views. Well, I appreciate your candor about that because um, it can invite uh, some uh, aggressive responses. And and to be honest, it's 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 somewhat um, I don't want to say refreshing, but it's it's important for us to hear your voice because a, a, a number of the guests we brought on recently are very supportive of um, of Reza Pahlavi and and um, excited about the possibility of him being somebody overseeing things. I, I guess part of it is that. 
you you know to be honest if you had told me six six months ago or a year ago that um that his poll numbers again with the caveat of we don't know exactly how accurate this kind of polling can be but would be this high i would be surprised uh but i think it's the way he um and maybe the folks around him have acquitted themselves and this desire for people to want something balanced you know somebody somebody uh, um uh after this disaster of a of a regime uh to, 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 to shepherd this through. And he's, you know, even his statement this, this weekend about next week's rallies where he's saying, look, let's just be unified. You don't have to like me. You don't have to like anybody in particular. Um, he's certainly saying all of the things that I would want him to say. Yes, I think, and that's why I'm saying if he can do, if he can be that person, then by all means, he should be that person. And at the same time, I think it's important if he wants to be that person to make clear that that to to see the role of the of the Kurdish people in Iran and to see the role of, of the minorities in Iran, because what I know that people like Kurds and, and minorities are, are worried about is that this nationalism is going to come like upon them and again, take away the rights of, of and, the, and, the, and the needs and the demands of the minorities in Iran. And there is no re revolution without Kurdistan. Let's be honest. This revolution started in Kurdistan and they've been relentless. People in Kurdistan and people in, in Sistan Baluchistan, mm. they have been rallying for months now, nonstop. There has been general strike in uh, big parts, large parts of Kurdistan. They're at the forefront of this revolution. And if there are voices that say you don't have a role and you are going to be suppressed again, then there is no revolution. So whoever takes on the role of, of I wouldn't say leading, but to be like in, in front of everything. Shepherding. I think that, yeah, <laughs> Shepherding. Yeah. Then I think that person should acknowledge the role of the minorities because if, if they're supposed to be free and democratic Iran, then for the first time, minorities need to, to have autonomy. They need to have their role and not to be suppressed. And they've been suppressed for decades. And I think that's a very important thing to have for a free run. Let me move to um, less auspicious news, it's at least for those who want change in Iran. I mean, the frustrating news out of Europe, at least for many Iranians, since we last spoke, uh, was the rejection by the EU of that motion to place the IRGC on the terrorist list across Europe. Um, Gil, in, in so many ways, uh, this feels like a broken record, but it seems like a no-brainer, no something obvious that would be done. Uh, what happened and why is there continued resistance to truly isolating this regime when European leaders seem to say all the right things about condemning the actions of the Islamic Republic? One word, JCPOA. It's the nuclear deal. Politicians in, in a lot of European states, in a lot of European countries, as well as in, in Germany, they want to go ahead with the nuclear deal. And they know once the IRGC is on the terrorist list, there is no neg negotiations with this regime anymore. And to, to like, I, I just talked about this today to one to a politician, and I said, if there was a nuclear deal that is really going to stop this regime from having nuclear weapons, then I am for that. Because the worst thing that could happen is for this regime to have nuclear weapons. Like there's nothing, nothing worse. Because then all hopes for revolution are gone. Because they, like they, ha they will have so much power that there is nothing, nothing left to do. But this nuclear deal that's on the table, the JCPOA, is not that deal. And so, really, I don't understand how politicians can sacrifice the freedoms movement in Iran for this deal. But that's what they're doing. Like I, I I know a list of countries in the European Union who will never agree to the IRGC be put on the terrorist list. And so I do not think that's going to happen. I don't think that's something that, that will happen. Again, I mean I, I think we've this this conversations like this have probably been drummed out uh um over and over again in, in recent years. But if it, you know, what what is that really about? What is this? Um, what are these European leaders that you speak of who are so committed to the JCPOA? What do they really want? 
I mean, I, th I think it's a, it's a range of, of things. So one thing, for one thing, basically, they want stability in the Middle East. That's what they want. And stability for them means no uprisings, no revolutions, just, you know, some dictators that we know and that we can deal with and that who don't have nuclear bombs. And that's that. And that's a very colon colonial, like racist view on, on the Middle East because they don't care, basically. They don't care about freedom and human rights in that region. They just want stability and peace and quiet. Only they have a completely different understanding of what that is. Of course, people in Iran or in Afghanistan, for that matter, they, for them, there is no stability. There's, there's a suppression and, and pain. And what does stability, what does stability represent? What is that? What does that word mean? Money? In the long run, yes. But in the short run, it's just security. You know, they like Iran in, in, in the Western view, Iran is super stable. It's not Iraq. It's not Afghanistan. It's not Syria. It has the borders are intact. There, there's no ISIS. There's like nothing. There's no civil war. Nothing they need to worry so, about. So democracy be damned. We'll take the, the dictators as long as they don't cause too much trouble. They would never say that explicitly, but of course that's what it is. They, I, I don't remember who said it, but they, they just say I, I, they just want a dictator that's on on helpful to them. Basically, they don't care if it's a dictator of, or not. And so that's a very that's for them security policy. And so this this uprising, this revolution that's been happening for for almost five months now, that just brings unease and instability in the views of a lot of Western countries. And that's what's happening. And yeah. so having a nuclear deal, negotiating with the with the regime is number one priority. And they don't care. <laughs> like a couple of weeks ago, Abdullah Yan, the, the foreign minister of Iran, he like just he enjoyed being in front of those cameras and saying, Ah, the you know, the, the RGC will will not be put on the terror list, Joseph Borrell and, and Sweden, they told me. And like you could see how he really yeah. he loved saying that because he knows that that's exactly what's happening. What was your what was your take on the reformist leaders in Iran coming out with words against the regime this weekend? You know, Musavi, even Khatami, and and concomitantly uh, Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei um, allegedly agreeing to offer some kind of amnesty and reduce the sentences for for prisoners who've been arrested in in the recent um, anti-government um, rallies and, and things. What, what 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 do you make of all of that activity? When I looked at the at the German news sites this morning, I, I was horrified because again, all the news sites just they the headlines were Khamenei is, is pardoning tens of thousands of prisoners and how many like all like word for word every every news site had the same headline and i just thought wow that like the pr of the islamic republic is so strong because the 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 irna irna the the state uh, news agency they just said that and everyone copies what they say and like this game has been played for years for decades even that you know so-called reformists say you know yeah yeah we can make some changes and and things are going to get better we, we hear you we hear you and of course nothing's going to get better because like for me a reformist in iran like imagine uh, like i don't know a guy beating his wife with a with a belt with like i don't know yeah and then reformist is like him just beating her less or something mm. i mean that's just reformist in, in the islamic republic and that's actually why a lot of people, and I've talked to some of them, they told me since 2019, they hate reformists even more than they had to hate the hardliners because they've, they've played theater for them for decades and they believed them because they wanted to believe them because of course they want things to get better. They want more freedom. They want things to get a little easier, life to mm. be a little easier they promised it to them over and over and over and it just got worse and worse but musavi's words seemed quite s strong by um reformist you know uh, part of the regime uh, standards i mean no i mean, do, do you do you think that that it was just the same old claptrap about um oh let's try and be nicer to people or or something i mean it sounded like he was actually saying the regime has to go 
Yeah, I don't think from him because from him he has no power. He's been in, in house arrest since two thousand nine. Right. Because in him, him, him and his wife. Um. So, I I believe that's a sentiment. I believe that he believes that because he's also suffered by the hands hands of this regime. But he has no power. He doesn't have anything to say to that. Like it's not like him saying that will change things. Right. But, but your but your re, but your reaction to Khamenei's um, statement is 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 imp, is important and telling. You know this is sort of um, being being actually alarmed by how that may be interpreted to take the pedal off the metal after to 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 sort of okay things are going to be okay they're going to make some little changes and i mean this is you know the same thing we heard a few months ago when they were um, you know peddling this idea that uh, um there's going to be some changes to the hijab law and everything will be fine and uh and and that is scary but on the other hand i see this as a this is a testament to a regime on the run. I mean, you know, scrambling to between extremely brutal crackdown and then, well, we'll offer an amnesty. I mean, they seem to be all over the place. Yeah, and I think that like something that really needs we, we shouldn't never forget is that this regime is not scared of a few thousands people of in the streets protesting without weapons. They're not scared of, of even general strikes or, or, you know, graffiti on the on the walls in, in the different cities. Like that's the thing that that needs to be understood that they the, the real fear of this regime is their own people defecting. That is what's going to bring the regime down in the end. And I think we talked about that last time. You know, there are thousands of people in this regime, mm. and they all profit. They've profited. They've they've gotten rich. They have a great life in, a, in an otherwise really poor country. A lot of people are live in poverty in Iran, but they've been great, and they only they've only seen the benefits, but not the disadvantages. So now, for the first time, they do see what's happening they do see what's happening in the prisons they do see the the pictures of the children that they mm -hmm. are killing and so that's what the regime is afraid of and showing leniency supposedly and saying like you know it's not that bad that is meant for for abroad as well as to the their own people saying listen everything is going to be fine don't worry about it you don't have to worry about being you know killed on the street someday or are in court for your crimes we are fine we are stable we're here and that's what what this whole charade is for mm. they just want to like really tell their own people that they're safe because if anyone will bring down the regime in the end it's going to be their own people and that's what they're afraid of well maybe on that note um and a couple questions before i let you go gilda i started today's show talking about how we shouldn't only judge the efficacy or the momentum of this revolution based on whether there's a million people in the streets in Iran or not. Uh, um, and how I believe the revolution is still going strong and that it is maturing or evolving and finding its footing in more than just street demonstrations, especially especially with what's happened outside of Iran, the, the notable and historic, I mean, notwithstanding some of what you said earlier, unification of Iranians around the world to take action against the regime. Do, do you... Uh, and please don't show any deference to me because you're on the show if you disagree. But do you agree that this is an evolution or are you concerned that things are stalling? No, it's definitely an evolution. Um, we've had that in 1979 in the Islamic Revolution, which was not Islamic at first, but that's what happened. Um, it takes a long time. And also people are finding different ways of protesting like i, I mentioned the graf graffitis in the streets like every morning the regime sends out their people to cover them mm. which is crazy and ridiculous but that's what they're doing because they're so afraid that the hatred of the people is shown on the streets and also people need, need to gather their their strength you know it's they've been they like that they actually protested for three months every day no way would I ever have believed that in the beginning. Hmm. Like that is, and even I think maybe you can tell too, like I, I'm tired. I, I've been tired for, for months now yeah. and I cannot even imagine what people in Iran are going through. So 
of course it's an evolution and it is going to lead to the downfall of this regime but it can take years no one knows how long it's going to take but there are going to be different phases there are going to be uh, you know uh, times when it feels like it's nothing's happening but that's not what's happening like i talked to a friend the other day in iran and she doesn't protest like she is just uh, she's not involved whatsoever and she's like yeah, we're very busy with the revolution like everyone is thinking about it mm -hmm. everyone is somehow busy with it mm -hmm. and and the the survey we talked in the beginning it shows that people want to be free mm -hmm. and they don't want to suppress every day so it's going to be different phases it's going to be be it's never going to be the same but it's always going to be an evolution because things are changing constantly and things are in the end moving forward but i don't i disagree that it could it is going to take years and the reason I I, the, the the reason I disagree is because I because the, the country can't sustain in the current mode of turmoil and there's no there's no going back you know no. it's people are people are too uh um as you say it's being expressed in different ways but um just the genie can't go back in the bottle so how long can you sustain with 80 percent of the population trying to overthrow you and 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 an entire if it remains unified or or can unify entire diaspora you know um with all its resources at at, at its uh, hands you know also working towards that end um th there's a there's a major g give us a sense before i let you go of the european um um the, the street, if you will, uh, if you can do that. There's a major global day of action coming up this Saturday, February 11th. Uh, there's also a big European rally planned for February 20th. Um, Gilda, how do you see the appetite for demonstrations and public support for for Iranians fighting for freedom amongst those that you observe and interact with in Germany and in Europe these days? I think it's pretty big. I know that uh, next Saturday it's going to be this big rally in Paris. And I think it's really good that it's in France because France plays a, a very major role in this whole um, issue in the relations of the European Union um, with Iran and the Iranian regime. And I know a lot of people, like it's similarly to um, in Berlin in October, the big rally, like buses of Iranians coming from all over the place. And I think especially now, after after weeks of you know seeing pictures of of people being tortured and killed and the executions and i also think that people long for some you know some common energy mm. and and sh and doing something after months of being depressed all the time like it's been a very difficult couple of months since since the first executions in on 8th yeah. uh, december 8th and i see big big willingness and hunger to to unite and to be together so i think it's going to be two very very important rallies are you going to paris no i can't do it every weekend but i will do a lot of posting and, and videos and, and share a lot of footage <laughs> it's it's always uh insightful having you on um hearing your expertise and hearing your opinions thank you and i look forward to the next time thank you so much bye 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 that's Gilda Sahibi in Berlin. And that's it. This is full time for Rook for today. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together each and every week. Roham, Anahita, Parisa, Pega, Mertad, and Shaya. Uh, thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe on any of our platforms if you haven't done so already, or all of them if you want. I remember we're... Um, you can find us on various podcast platforms. And if you want to watch what you're hearing on this program, oftentimes we put up video clips on Instagram and YouTube. And if you want your bulletins and your information from Rook in both English and Persian, check out our Telegram page at Rook Media. You can find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. Thank you so much. See you Thursday. Mizun Mashi.